All right, now we're into the good stuff. The collections. Uh, as I mentioned before, all the collections are immutable. Uh, that means that nothing in them can change. And of course, the first thing, first pang you usually get when you're faced with that sentence and you think about closure is, well, what if I need to change part of it? Uh, will I have to copy the whole thing? Uh, and the answer there is no. In addition to being immutable, closure collections are persistent. And persistence means that under the hood, they're implemented in a way such that when you want to create a modified version of a collection, that can be done and still meet all of the performance guarantees of the collection. Uh, in particular, it means that most of the modifications are constant or near constant time for hash maps and vectors and logarithmic time for trees. Uh, so it's not a full copy. Uh, it's not anything remotely near that. Uh, so typically, when we want a collection that's just like another collection but slightly changed, uh, we get a new value. Uh, and it shares a lot of uh, structure with the old value. And it can do that because neither of the two values can ever be changed. So you can share uh, quite freely. Uh, and that's what that whole other paragraph says. I mean, it, it allows the efficient creation of modified versions. Because everything is immutable, it's inherently thread safe. You can freely, without thinking twice, uh, reference any of the closure data structures from multiple threads, and nothing bad can happen to you. It simply cannot happen to you because they, they cannot change. In addition, it's wickedly efficient uh, to do that, to work that way, uh, because a lot of the data structures internally are also uh, not, not just promising immutability to the user, but actually, actually are immutable in their implementation. Uh, the Java uh, compiler and the hotspot runtime uh, can optimize them quite extensively. Uh, so they're, they're pretty fast. Uh, the second big part about the collections, as I started to talk about before, is that they're represented by abstractions. Uh, that means that you can't get too attached to the relationship between a particular uh, collection, as described here, and a particular implementation of it. For instance, uh, you know, I'll talk about maps a lot. There are a lot of different kinds of maps in Clojure. There are tree maps, uh, array maps, uh, structure maps, hash maps, uh, all of which provide the same interface and can be manipulated the same way, uh, but have different behavioral characteristics, mostly in performance or sortability. Uh, so that's a, that's a big deal. It means that when you write code, to an abstraction, either to the list abstraction, the sequence abstraction, the map abstraction, or the vector abstraction, that code will work with anything that implements that abstraction. Now, if you write code that works with a tree map, it works with a sorted map without any change. And it will work with future maps uh, that I haven't thought of or that you may need to write in order to do something specific for a particular application. That's a big deal. That's a big deal because there's a lot of syntax built into Clojure uh, that makes it convenient to talk about and interact with these data structures that is decoupled from their particular implementations. Uh, all right, so uh, collections form a hierarchy. There is a root to all the Clojure collections. It's called I persistent collection. And it defines three functions which are reflected in uh, the three functions you see here. Um, every collection can respond to count, which is a count of how many items are in it. That number can be zero. Uh, in addition, as you'll see here, count of nil is defined. In fact, many operations are defined on nil, as opposed to throwing a null pointer exception. Uh, it ends up, it might take you a little while to see the utility of that. You'd say, oh, I'd prefer to know I had nothing. Uh, but there are lots of cases where your code can be significantly smaller if uh, you leverage that value. And as long as you know how that's going to behave, uh, you, can, you can use it. So you just have to accept that uh, I've decided that's a good idea 
<laughs> and 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 know and understand how it works, and then you can use it, or be careful of it, whichever you know, whichever you you may consider. But it's not inherently wrong for count of nil to not fail in some way. It has a defined behavior. Uh, the next guy is Conj, C O N J. Uh, if you haven't programmed in Lisp. You won't necessarily recognize the pun associated with that and the name closure in general, which is a substitution of J for S. Uh, but it ends up that cons is a classic Lisp uh, function, and it meant to add something to the front end of a list. And what I've done is created an abstraction of that so that, uh, and I've called it something different so people wouldn't get confused, uh, conj. And it does have a word behind it, which is conjoin, and that's very much what it means. It means to uh, add a thing to something else. The cool thing about defining something like conj at the top level of this hierarchy means that you have an abstract way to add something to any kind of collection. It's the same function, conjoin. Uh, now, of course, it doesn't really add something to a collection because we said you can't change any collections. What it does is it returns a new version of the collection uh, with, with the thing added. Where it goes depends on the kind of collection. Lists will conjoin at the front. Uh, vectors will conjoin at the end. Maps will conjoin by adding that key value to the map. Uh, so. Why don't we look at that a little bit? So we've seen how to do the three kinds of literals. Uh, one of the tricks with literal lists is they must be quoted. Because we saw how if we say A, B, C in a list, the compiler is going to try to interpret the first thing in the list as an operation and to treat the entire list as a call. So we have defined A, right? We've defined it before as 1. I think it's still 1. Uh, but one still isn't a function, and so this is still not a valid function call. So if we want to talk about a list um, without evaluating it, without the compiler treating it as a function call, we have to quote it. Um, in general, you'll be doing not very much of this. It used to be the case in Lisp that you had to do a lot of quoted lists because lists, lists were your only data structure. So when you wanted to have a list of values that wasn't interpreted, uh, or evaluated, you had to quote it. Now I would prefer vectors in most cases, but I just want to show you what conjoin does in these three cases. So if this is a list, and what's it going to yield when we press enter? ABC. ABC. ABC or one, two, three? Oh, one, two, three. ABC. Yeah. ABC. Okay? Nothing is a value. We're quoting the list. The list when it was read was a list of three symbols. So when we quote it, we get a list of three symbols. None of the contents of the list are evaluated. Uh, it's not just a quoted list. It's not just an unevaluated list. Um, in other words, it's not just saying suppress the evaluation of the list. It's saying suppress the evaluation of the entire form. So we have a list of ABC. So if we conj onto that, conj always takes the collection first. Uh, and we're going to put a Let's call it X. We're going to put a keyword on. Uh, saying a couple of things. First of all, all of the data structures are heterogeneous. That means that they can hold a variety of types. Um, they're not uh, locked down to a particular type. So this list so far only has symbols in it, but I could add numbers to it or other objects or really anything I want. So we're going to conjoin uh, the keyword X to this list, and because it's a list, it goes at the front. Uh, I probably should have put that list in something. Uh, let's put it in LST. So now LST is that list of ABC. And I can easily say conjoin to list uh, X again. Should be the same result. But the big point here is that uh, nothing has happened to LST in this process. Okay. When you say conjoin, you get a new list. The other list is sitting around intact. 
Uh, it ends up lists are implemented as singly linked lists, right? And conjoin conjoins on the front, so it creates a new node and has the rest pointer of that node point to the existing list, uh, which means that the uh, the tail of this list is exactly the same list as LST. How can we find that out with what you've seen already? What do we want to know? What, whoops. What do we want to know is identical? Second and first uh, well, we want to make our call, right? But we don't want this whole list. What part of it do we want? The rest of the list. We haven't talked about sequences, but we want the rest of the list, which would be not the first thing, but the things after it. So is the rest of this list the same as what? Now, this isn't just the same as, is it the same value? This is the same as, is it the same object? And it ends up it is. So the tail of this thing is list, and it can be because since neither could be changed, they can share structure. So it's not like the whole list is copied. In fact, none of the list is copied. One new node, link, singly linked list node, which is a two-slot data structure, is created with X in it, uh, and the rest of it points to the other. So that's how persistence is done for lists. It's pretty easy to understand, and that's very traditional Lisp. Uh, and it's a very valuable thing, sharing structure like that. Uh, and having it be persistent. But now let's move to something uh, a little bit more interesting. Let's get a vector in play. So we have our vector vec. Okay, this is a vector of three numbers. Similarly, we can conjoin onto vec, and we'll add four. Uh, as I said before, that goes at the end. Uh, unlike lists where there's a simple way for me to describe how it works, which is that's a singly linked list and the node points to the rest of the thing. Um, persistent vectors are extremely tricky. Um, and it's, it took me a long time to come up with efficient implementations of persistent vectors and hash tables. They're extremely rare things. Like, you won't see them anywhere else. But they're an, a very important part of Clojure working the way it does. Because once you have them, you can write programs that do what real programs do, which is need to look things up in near constant time. Uh, most programs I've written have needed hash tables. I don't see how you can really do without that. But having it be persistent is particularly powerful, which means you can incrementally modify hash tables, un make undo and redo stacks of hash tables and vectors. Um, so this vector is intact, uh, as we see. We didn't change the original. Uh, but there won't be any identical trick with this. Um, there is shared structure uh, underneath the hood, but the structure of a persistent vector is, is, a, is a complex uh, thing we could talk for an hour about just by itself. Um, it, is a, it actually does use a tree under the hood uh, with a 32-way branching strategy uh, based around uh, hash tries, trees they're called. Uh, so you have to take my word for it that it's efficient. <laughs> Uh, and it is efficient. It's not quite constant time. It's actually log 32 to the n. Uh, but log 32 is an extremely narrowing factor. In other words, log 32 of whatever, a million is not very much. And then 4 billion is only 6, right? Not even 5 and a half. Uh, no, 6 and 6. Uh, so as a branching factor, it's so small, you can almost treat it like a constant factor. So uh, vectors and uh, hash tables have near, what I call near constant lookup characteristics. You can treat them like you treat vectors and hash tables in languages you're familiar with. Except they have this miraculous property, which is that they're immutable and persistent. Uh, in particular, like changing one thing at the end also has that near constant time property. Uh, all right, that's vector. Any question on vectors? One of the neat things about a vector is, unlike a list, uh, getting at the last thing in a list is expensive. It's a linear time thing to go all the way through. 
Uh, and certainly vectors, uh, you have a presumption that getting at any piece of it is efficient. And that is the case. Getting at any part, the first, second, third, not just the end. In other words, not just at the end you're adding to. Um, both ends are, are fast. Uh, finally, we have map. Let's, uh, we'll put in something. Typically with maps, we don't use conj very much. Uh, we use uh, associate, A-S-S-O-C, uh, much more often because we usually are talking about the keys and values independently. Uh, but it ends up that conj is defined on maps and it's defined as adding a map to a map. So we can conj onto M another map. Just like that. Again, this is not something you do that often, but it's there mostly to keep things uniform. Uh, in addition, you can conj on map entries onto maps, and that will work. So when you sequence through a map, you get a sequence of map entries, which are like key value pairs, and those can be conged onto a map as well. Well, now you're seeing the hash nature of the literal maps. Okay, so literal maps are hash maps. Uh, which means they don't have predictable printing or iteration or sequencing uh, order uh, because they're hashed internally. Is there such a thing as a sorted map? Sure is. Rich, you already talked about commas being white space. Uh, oh, no, I didn't. Look at that. There's commas in my map. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write them when I put it in, did I? And yet, here they are. Uh, commas are white space. They don't mean anything. You can put them in the middle of your data structures if you like. If they help you read them, uh, go for it. Uh, typically, I find myself not writing them very much, but appreciating the fact that they print like this. Yeah. Uh, especially, you know, key value, key value uh, is pretty straightforward, but if you had a map that was number, 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 number. It's, it's handy in larger lists. Yeah. It, can, it can be tricky to see how it gets delimited yeah. without them. Uh, but by all means, feel free to use it. And yes, uh, commas are white space. Uh, so we started to talk about sorted map. Let's, uh, let's make one. You have to use a function call to get a sorted map. But it takes as arguments uh, the same key value, key value as the literal does. Now, the trick here is that it's going to be sorted by key, and so that will print out in order. Now, M printed out in order, too. So let's go back to the conj call, and we'll do SM as the target, the same two other guys, which we saw scramble around in the hash map. That won't happen here. Okay. The sorted map will maintain sort order. Uh, sorted maps can be created uh, by default. They presume the keys are implement comparable is a Java interface for things that can be compared to each other. Uh, but you can supply uh, a sorted map with a comparator, in which case that will be used to compare the items. And that way you can get things sorted by internal keys or in reverse order or whatever. Now, if you, if you conj uh, onto the map again, would you see with a different value? Is it, it just, it's just like a regular search? Uh, yes. So what if it, what if the value was already there is the question. What if M already had a B, which it does, mm -hmm. and I'm going to say B is 5. Uh, yeah, it will replace the value that's already there. All right, so conjing onto a map means associating those keys with those values. And associate is a replacing thing. Of course, nothing has really happened to SM. Uh, B is still 2 there. Uh, but in this, con in this new value we created by conjing these two things together, um, the value that's been added is the one that wins. Okay. All right, we jumped a little bit ahead. Well, that's, so that's conjing. So we saw conjing on lists, 
goes at the front, vectors goes at the end, maps associates the key and values of the conch thing into the original guy. The other big function supported by all collections is seek, short for sequence. Um, what this does is based around the collection type, it returns something that implements the sequence interface. Okay. That's different from the collection itself being a sequence. Some collections are sequences, like lists are sequences. Um, other collections, like vectors, are not sequences. They're sequential, but they're not the same thing as a sequence. And maps pretty much don't even look at all like sequences. Uh, but no matter what kind of collection you have, you can call seek on it and get something that is a sequence that lets you see the contents of the collection in a sequential manner. Uh, so let's just look at that. We have our three guys now. If we seek, um, what did I call the first thing? LST, we get that. One of the interesting things about seek on lists is that lists are their own sequence. That's not true of the other collection types. We can get a sequence of the items in a vector. And you'll notice how these sequences are printing. They print like what? Lists, right? Vec is that. And seek vec prints that way. So when you see parenthesis delimited lists, uh, it doesn't mean anything more than it's a sequence. When it prints, because sequences and oh, I want to and what's the sequence of the map? Call that M. You see the little pairs in there. It's a sequence of those things are uh, map entries, uh, but that syntax you see there is not readable. In other words, I can't I can't type in a one and have anything useful happen. Okay, that's just a printing thing, and that's a, an asymmetry in printing and reading. Uh, but it doesn't matter because you usually you print maps like that, which is a readable thing. All right, we saw a little bit about lists. Uh, their collections, uh, as I showed or proved before, they implement iSeq directly. In other words, when we asked for the seek of a list, we got itself because it doesn't need to do any work. It directly implements the sequencing interface. Um, count is state of one. That's an interesting property. So a real list, which you either can create using quote or by saying list and passing the items, is a data structure that maintains the count efficiently. That's not typical of singly linked lists, where usually you, know, you, have, to, you have to go through and count them all. So usually it's, it's big O, N. Uh, Conj puts it at the front, as we saw. Uh, so list creates one. List star creates uh, a list given individual items and another list that puts those items at the front. You want to see that? Now, it said seek there, didn't it? So I'm going to put in a vector at the end, because a vector can be turned into a seek. And so it connects the first guys to the last guy. The last guy must be a sequence, or something that can turn into a sequence. What's the difference between that and apply list? Apply list. If I say apply list, one, two, three, and then four, five, six. Not much. It's shorter. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it, 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 it's a common operation. Yeah, no, it's uh, But we haven't talked about apply, which no, is an advanced kind of a thing. Yeah. Uh, peak. For lists, peak is the same as first. But peak and pop are part of uh, a stack protocol that's supported by both lists and vectors, which is kind of really neat. 
Let's try it. We peek at one, two, three, we get the first guy. We pop, we get the rest. Of course, there's first and rest for this. But if you were using a list as a stack, this would be more intuitive to read than using first and rest that way. But the cool thing is, um, these work on vectors. What do you think this returns? Come on. One, three. One, three. 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 Why? Because that's the that's the uh, the open end on a vector, right? That's what we can push stuff onto. When we conch stuff on, it goes on the end. Uh, but also cool is that. So you can treat lists as stacks on the front end, and vectors as stacks on the back end. What's the difference? Um, the iteration order of both is the same. Right? We saw seek. Oh, do we do seek yet? Or vectors? Yeah, we did. Right? It's, it doesn't go three, two, one, right? It goes one, two, three. Uh, so these are different characteristics you can take advantage of. The fact that you can treat both as stacks, uh, but vectors have the same uh, relative to its stack, which is on one end, it enumerates from the other end. Whereas a uh, list will push and pop from the same end it enumerates from. Uh, and the nice thing is you can switch between these two in an algorithm that uses stacks and not have to change anything if you've used peak and pop. Uh, so if we say first one, two, three, only one or three? First of what? From the back there. Is it a vector? Well, we haven't talked about first yet, but uh, what do you think? <laughs> I, hope it's, I hope it's one. I think the first string in one, two, three is one. <laughs> Right, because first manipulates the sequence of items in the vector. And the sequence, oh. as we saw, is one, two, three. Oh. Okay? First is about sequences. And we could talk about that. So let's just skip quickly. What is a sequence? A sequence is something that supports only two functions. The first is first, which returns the first thing in the sequence. The second function is rest, which returns the rest of the things in the sequence. Uh, really the only other things to know are uh, the fact that if there's no more things rest returns nil in particular it does not return that it doesn't empty out the collection it's a sequence on it and when there's no more things there's no more sequence so when there's nothing more rest returns nil uh, in addition first and rest are defined for nil what do you think they return? The only reasonable thing. Mm -hmm. And again, take my word for it, this is better than them throwing exceptions. Uh, OK, so let's uh, dig into vectors a little bit. Uh, they're collections. I say that only to imply they support count, seek, and what? Conj. Right. All the three main functions. Uh, count is big O1. One of the neat things about vectors is they support rseq. What do you think that does? rseq. One, two, three. Okay. It doesn't reverse the items in the vector. The vector is what it was. Um, but uh, it also can provide this sequence in a hurry, this reverse order sequence. Whereas reversing a list takes all the time it takes to touch every item in the list. Getting a reverse version of a sequence of a vector is constant time. That's something that you could leverage in your programs when you're aware of it. Uh, we saw a literal constructor for vectors with the square brackets. In addition, there is a function called vector. 
Uh, and there's a functional way to create all of these things because you're not going to create a morphem literals. A lot of times you're going to have data or construct data and then need to make a vector uh, from it. And it just takes a list of the items and it makes a vector out of them. Uh, here now we start seeing uh, a portion of the interface of, of associative things. It ends up that a vector is associative much the same way a map is. Right, what are the keys of a vector? The indexes, indexes, right? The indices in a vector are the keys. And so because of that, uh, Clojure unifies that so that you can manipulate vectors and maps similarly by treating a vector as a, a map of numbers to values. Uh, so you can call ASOC on a vector uh, one of the things that's important is that uh, the index be in bounds. Right? ASOC takes uh, an associative thing and it associates a key with a value. Okay, so we can use it on a vector because the vector is an associative thing. And we've associated item number one, which is the second item, because we count from zero, with five. Uh, it's a cool property of uh, vectors that, uh, and of course the key has to be in range, I said, we said that we can go 13 here and boom, index out of bounds. Right? We can't create gaps in our vector. Mm -hmm. But we can do one interesting thing and useful thing with vectors, which is where is three, index three, zero based in this vector? Now, where is it? It's, it's after, it's outside. But it's outside by how much? One. It's just one after. This is OK. OK? So you can associate to the, just at the end of a vector in order to grow it. Uh, why would you do this? Well, again, depending on the algorithm you're using, you may want to you know, not care whether it's a map or a vector. And if people know that you're doing that, they know they could grow it by passing in incrementing numbers. Uh, so it's a powerful and useful thing to be able to do. So you can associate with the, uh, an index that's, that is equal to the length of the vector, and it will add to the vector by doing that. Okay? Uh, get. Get is the associative call. Uh, it returns the value uh, at the vector, at that index. But like the associative interface, the associative interface says if you call get and the key is not found, you get nil. And sure enough, these, that key is out of range, I get nil. That key is in range, I get the value. nth is similar, it takes a vector and an index, but nth is just for vectors and uh, constant time integer indexed things. Uh, it happens to also work for Java arrays, for instance, uh, and strings. It even works on sequences. But the main thing, main point about it here is, uh, there's get, there's nth. nth is the guy to use if you want to do index checking, if you'd rather get an exception. Uh, than, than nils. And again, depending on the kind of algorithm you're using, sometimes you don't, you just want to know is it in range? Yes or no? In which case, returning nil is fine. Other times, you really want to make sure you don't accidentally go outside and get, get nils at, you know, by accident. These are, like I said, near constant time operations, so vectors are fast. Uh, peak and pop, we talked about already, right? They work on the end of a vector. Uh, popping an empty vector throws an exception. That's important to know. Uh, and the other cool thing about vectors is that they support really fast subvector operations. So given a vector and a start inclusive and endpoint exclusive indexes, You'll get a subvector. It shares structure structure with the original vector. This vector could be enormous, 
this thing is a constant time instantaneous operation subvector returns a little structure that implements the interface of vector but leaves all the data in the original vector so it copies nothing uh, would, a, would a vector of, of a string be a, a bunch of characters would be a sequence of characters a vector of, of a string yeah. well a string isn't a vector um, well, I'm just thinking that it would be like a, would it, would it be just like a vector of characters? A yeah, string? Yeah, how could you get that, get that into a, to do substring operations? If the yeah. second argument, if the first argument of subvector was a string, what would it turn return? Mm, nothing good. It's not a vector. No, string no, is no. not a vector. Quote S, quote, quote Q, quote R, quote I, quote N, quote U. Well, you want a vector of the characters in a string. Right. Okay. So it'd be, it'd be called vector on string. If you want it, <laughs> strings have sub Substring. string and you know some other efficient things. They already do this yeah, efficiently, so I don't know if there's a tremendous advantage, but that's how you do it. Well, we haven't talked about apply yet, but well, vector will will put a string, the whole string, into the vector as one element because the string is a value. Uh, so you first have to take the string apart into its constituent characters. Uh, mm -hmm. Then you're going to have a list of things, and apply takes a function and takes that list of things and makes it as if it's the argument list to the function call. That's jumping ahead a little bit, but. Uh, so it's an important thing to remember that you have an extremely fast subvector, and you can take advantage of that. You can almost use vectors as if they were, you know, like you can do windowing things extremely quickly with no copying. Uh, and you, you wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate at all to do that. Like if you had 10 million things and you needed a, you know, a thousand item window, you could subvec and move up by one by one by one by one by one. That would be lightning to do. Um, and the resulting subvector is a vector. It implements the complete interface of vector. Um, so it's a good example of the fact that shared structure, right? it shares the structure. Uh, but that also implies there's at least two implementations of vector under the hood, right? Because there's the real vector and the subvector thing is obviously some different type that does the shared, shared structure and, and, and mapping through this other thing. You don't need to know or care. A subvector is as good as a vector in every respect. Uh, okay. Last, we have maps. Uh, then we'll probably have to wrap it up uh, for now. Uh, maps implement this interface, iPersistent Map, and there are many implementations of maps. Uh, there are two, I have to fix that because there are more than two provided, but the two main kinds are hashed maps and sorted maps. Uh, hash maps are going to call hash code and equals on the keys. Uh, hash code and equals are defined for all the closure types correctly. Um, you can use other Java types, you know, subject to the quality of their hash code and equals. Um, as I said before, sorted maps, you can either have keys that implement comparable, which most Java data structures do, um, and all the closure primitive things do, like strings and keywords uh, and symbols support comparable. Uh, or you can pass in a comparator to sorted map by uh, this guy here. We'll take a comparator and then the key values, in which case the comparator is used. Um, hash maps are way faster lookup, log 30 to the n, versus sorted maps, which are a red-black tree, which is balanced but has uh, big O log n access, which is still very fast, and there are plenty of functional languages that only get by with um, regular red black tree uh, associative data structures but in, in you know in the real world I think you simply have to have hash tables um, and closure provides them uh, sorted maps are sorted otherwise they pretty much are identical um, sorted maps also support R seek reverse uh, sequencing which makes no sense for hash maps because hash maps don't promise the order of the keys anyway in sequencing uh, 
And so what is a mapping? Logically, a map is a function of a key that returns a value. Right? And a map is a storage of those relationships between keys and values. Uh, you can use nil as a key. You can use nil as a value. Uh, just be careful in that some of the functions for getting the values of maps return nil if they're not found. So if you're going to put nils in a map, you have to be aware of that. And there are ways to interact with the maps so that you can find out whether there's actually something there or you're getting the nil that was there or there was nothing there. Uh, you can distinguish that. So there are three constructor functions. Again, we saw that the curly brace literal, you know, that the reader reads, will return a hash map or something that will eventually turn into a hash map. Very small ones actually have other implementations. There are lots of map implementations under the hood. Uh, what you really care about is whether it's hashed or sorted, because those are the two performance differences. Uh, sorted map will create a sorted map, as we saw, and sorted map by takes the comparis comparator. Uh, uh, associ is associate, and it does what we saw already for uh, vectors. It's going to take an existing map, and it's going to return a new map of the same basic type, either hashed or sorted where that key is mapped to that value. If it was already there, this mapping will be the new mapping in the, in the returned value. It won't ever affect the existing map. Uh, and now it's not documented here, but a SOCH takes arbitrary number of key value pairs. Uh, so we can try it. Let's see, do we still have M? <coughs> we have M, so we can associate with M. And you can see why this would be. Uh, uh, when did you add that? Is that the, uh, was it in there? No. I was going to say, I wanted that. I added it when I needed it, like <laughs> when I add everything. <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> it's really convenient. And you can see why this is um, more commonly used. No. <laughs> more, well, associated with key and value, but not arbitrary key, right. numbers of keys oh, and yeah. values. Yeah. Um, but you can see why this is preferred to conj, because you don't have to create a map out of the, the other guys. And this is the normal way you interact, you add things to maps. And you know, of course, we're not really changing the map. So every time I say add or set or, you know, I'm, I don't really mean it. Uh, I'm saying it gives the effect of that. But you do have to get used to the fact that you have to catch the return value of this. This doesn't actually change the thing. Um, but I did choose conj, associ, and dissoci for a reason, rather than put uh, you know, set because they don't actually change the thing. So I'm trying to help encourage you to think about the fact that you know, it doesn't really add something to the thing that you're passing. It gives you a new value where the thing has been conjoined or associated. Um, so thus the names. You get used to it pretty quick, I think. Associate and dissociate. Uh, dissociate goes the other way. It'll be the same map without that key in it. Right, so uh, oops. So we know M has A and B still. Look at it, it's not changed at all in all this mucking around. Uh, and we can take out the B key. Um, we can also try to take out something that's not there. No problem. This is a map without E. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. There's a map without E. It didn't have E, but it doesn't have it now, so that satisfies the requirement. Um, in addition, this now takes multiple values. So we can empty it out that way. I mean, it's still there, but we can get a value with the others taken out. Uh, same get as before. We saw for associative you know, arrays or associative, so they support get. Maps also support get. Same rules. Get the key. If it's not there, return nil. Um, also not in the docs here is the fact that get takes a third value which is what to return if it's not there. So let's, uh, let's make a new map, uh, MN, which has a nil in it. So we look at MN, we see A is 1, B is nil. So which means if we were to get B uh, from N MN, well, is it there? That's the same, whoops. Uh, sorry about that. 
That's the same result I would have gotten if I said this, when C isn't in there. So how do we tell what's going on? Uh, there's a couple of ways. One is there is a function called contains, which looks for the key. No C in there. B. Yes. That's one way. So we can just look for the key. But of course, if we were trying to get the value, we'd have to call contains and then get in two steps. So get takes a third argument, which is return this uh, thing if, if it's not there. Uh, so I'm saying get from M and C, and if it's not there, return this value, not found. So now I have a safe way to get things that might be null, because I can distinguish this. See? Now I get a nil out. It wasn't not found, it was found, and its value was nil. So this is a way to interact with maps where you might be storing nil on purpose. And you can't then use nil as a way to see uh, whether or not something was there. You can pass any value you want as the third value, and that's what will come back. It's also a nice way to do a seed value. If you're going to start up with an with empty map and you want the first value to be 1, you can, instead of having like put it in there in advance, you can say get, where if not found value is 1, which means the first value you get will always be 1. Even if there was no entry, then you could add something to it or multiply it by something and then put it back in. No special cases required. Uh, so that can be useful. Um, and then there's a bunch of other functions. Find will return the map entry, so you'll get the key value pair out if it's there. Otherwise, you'll get nil. That's another way to go in looking for things. So if I said to find uh, in MNC, I get nil. There's nothing there. But if I try, I keep hitting that key. But if I try to find B, I'll get the key value pair B and nil. Oh, that's weird. That should print nil. That's a bug. <laughs> uh, that's not a readable thing anyway, but I'd like that to print nil. Uh, okay, so that's fine. Uh, select, I'm not going to talk about right now. Key and val. If I have one of these map entries, I can get at the pieces of it using key and val. Um, usually, you will end up using those if you've turned the map into a sequence. Then you can use, the sequence will be a sequence of map entries, and you can use key and val to get at the pieces of that map entry uh, that's returned. Does that make sense? So uh, we, we did seek, well, let's just do it again. We did seek of M before, right? It had these pairs in it. So the first of this is a pair, right? A key, it's a map entry. And if we want to see what's the key of that thing, we can do that. Similarly, val will return the val part of a map entry like that. Okay. Uh, there's also keys and vowels, which returns a sequence of the keys of a map or a sequence of the vowels <coughs> in the map. So we go back to this, and if we say, give me, I don't need to say uh, seek anymore. If I say keys of M, it's A and B. And if I say vowels of M, it's 1 and 2. So, and those are sequences. Uh, they're more efficient than mapping key over seek of M or val over seek of M. So you want to use them when that's what, that's what you want. Uh, merge will combine maps, uh, an arbitrary set of maps into one. Um, Last one in wins. Okay, so it starts with A1, B2, then it merges in B4, C3, then it merges in A5. And uh, cons will only put one thing on. Cons can also deal with map entries. Uh, merge takes an arbitrary set of maps, and they all have to be maps. 
um, but they're a little bit similar. I would definitely say prefer merge. Conj, conj, yeah. Conj is for code that really doesn't want to know it's manipulating maps. It wants to manipulate data structures really generically if you're going to be using it on maps. It's probably because you wrote a data structure you wanted to work with maps and lists and vectors without knowing. You would use conj all the time for vectors and lists, uh, but not for maps so much. What? Zip map is Did I skip over? Zip? No, it's not here. That's in, uh, that's in sequences. And finally, there's merge with, uh, which takes a function, and it will be uh, used to arbitrate um, conflicts. So as you go through here, now instead of having B4 replace B2, uh, 4 will be added to 2. Similarly, rather than have A5 replace A1, A5 will be added to 1. Oops. Merge with. Oh, merge with. Don't I need to say that? It's always still having to type. I know. I should right. just figure out what I want. So, uh, so you can see that's that's pretty cool, and you can do arbitrary functions that way. Like if you were trying to combine these and you wanted, you know, a set, a set of each thing, you could you, know, you could merge with lists and you'll get lists at each key. Um, so that's pretty powerful and tiny. And I think we'll wrap start. it up here. Any questions about these? These are like the really core things.